Broadcasting from occupied territories, War the Flea Media, it's the Reality Dysfunction Podcast. A space where a diverse group of brown folk from across the nation explore the political experiences and social future of our Chicano Latino community. Control the narrative, resist the dysfunction. Hey everyone, it's uh, nice to have you back for another episode of the Reality Dysfunction. This is Dr. Ernesto Morales back with another awesome interview. Today I have with me uh, Dr. Vanessa Bustamante, who I have known the last uh, couple of years in uh, the work that we've been doing with the uh, Partido Nacional de la Raza Unida, or for those of you who are not up on the latest lingo, the Raza Unida Party. Uh, Vanessa is currently the co-chair of the Raza Unida Party, and so I'm really excited to have this sister here. She does great work. She is awesome. And I am looking forward to this uh, conversation. So Vanessa, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, some of the work that you're doing? Thank you, Mireles. Uh, It's great to be here with you and to join you in this conversation. I'm excited. And I guess a, a little bit about myself. I identify as a Chicana first generation in this country. I come from immigrant parents from Sinaloa and Jalisco. And I grew up in areas such as the San Fernando Valley and East Los Angeles, where most of my family is from. So I grew up in predominantly Chicano communities. Uh, So for me, uh, getting involved in uh, Chicano identity, Chicano culture started as a little girl, uh, seeing the lowriders cruising through Whittier Boulevard in East L.A., uh, seeing people marching on the streets um, for equality, equity, and visibility um, and support. And so uh, for me, you know, being a high school student, um, going actually going through the whole process of education, I was very much singled out. I was, uh, I grew up being very dark um, complexioned. And so, you know, got called, you know, derogatory words um, growing up. I was constantly, because I had a, a an accent, I was constantly made fun of for my accent. I actually started off in ESL as a as a child um, when I started school. And I would constantly be told things like, go back to Mexico, you little beaner, uh, things like that at school. Uh, because I was, I was going to school in the San Fernando Valley and I was going to school in places where there weren't um, as many uh, Chicanos or Raza. I went to... Um, predominantly white and Asian schools, especially through middle school. I went to a Catholic school and then I went to a Catholic high school. Uh, So there were very few Chicanos or Raza identified folks. And um, for me, that was, I think that was hard because of the fact that uh, they singled me out. And so they thought my accent was funny and um, I would be told that I couldn't speak Spanish. I actually, I remember in the fifth grade, I was benched for speaking Spanish to a girl in my class who had just come from El Salvador. So I wanted to be her friend and um, talk to her and, you know, understand each other. And uh, we were constantly benched uh, for speaking Spanish. So even though a lot of people think that those things happened over 60 years ago, you know, I'm not, I'm not that old, you know, I'm 33 and I, it happened you know, um, even 20 years ago. So um, it hasn't been that long, you know, that our our people have been facing discrimination and prejudice and, um, you know, and I experienced some of those things growing up. So that really made me conscious at an early age. I was constantly questioning why my community was being treated this way, uh, why um, there weren't, uh, there wasn't representation of us, you know, I think, in different positions that I saw, even with teachers, I didn't see that many Rasa teachers. And so for me, I was always questioning like, well, where are we? You know, I come from communities where like, there's a lot of us, like, especially in East LA, everywhere you look, it's just Rasa. So I was just constantly questioning that and really going to college, being a Chicano studies major, for me, really, 
really opened my eyes to what was going on, putting words to the actual things I was trying to understand. And also learning about the educational pipeline, I think completely transformed my life and made me set goals um, higher than I ever, I ever imagined for myself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had, I had very similar ex- Well, No, I didn't have very similar experience, but I had a similar experience in one way. And the thing that you said was that as I was going through school and particularly when I got in college, I was just like, what is going on here? You know, like Mm. everybody was white. It just blew me away because where, you know, how I grew up with my family, you know, they were all black and Latino. And I mean, I knew that there were a lot of uh, Mexicans, Chicanos around, you know, there were a lot of black people around, but when I got into higher education, it was the complete absence of them. Mm. that just shocked me to, you know, to my core. I didn't know the story about, um, the language about the, the Spanish. That's, uh, that's crazy sister, yeah. because, you know, people talk about that, like that happened a long time ago. Right. But I think, you know, I think it's still happening today. Oh, for sure, you know. it's still happening. I've seen people even turn on, on on other people and make it more about themselves. Like, oh, you shouldn't be speaking Spanish because we can't understand you and we don't know if you're talking about us. And I'm like, that's a that's a you problem, <laughs> you know, like but they're putting it back yeah. on the Spanish speaker. And I'm like, you know, I see it in those those micro aggressive ways. <clears throat> but I'm like, it still happens in yeah. macro aggressive ways, you know. Yeah. Ain't nobody got time to talk about you. Just right. You, yeah. <laughs> Trust People me. We're just talking <laughs> in their most comfortable, right. you know, state. Well, trying to go get some ice cream. Right. You're, you're talking about me. <laughs> Nobody's talking about you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, then that really. Okay. I mean, wow. That's um. That's intense. That is intense. I I do have one question though. What does mm-hmm. it mean to be benched? Benched. So when we were benched, um we basically were caught by the teachers speaking Spanish. And so we were, you know, we were at that point labeled as bad. So if you're bad, uh, you can't play for the rest of recess or lunch. And so there were these benches that were attached to the concrete walls of the school. And so we just had to sit there silently for the rest of recess or lunch um whenever until the bell rang and then we were excused to then go back into class so there was some stigma that was attached to this oh yeah i mean even in the fifth grade i remember my teacher was a nun her name was sister michaeline and uh, she had a row of bad kids and guess who sat in the row the whole year (laughs) me (laughs) Uh, i was one of the bad kids the whole year um and so there was there was a lot of labeling and stigma, and you know it's interesting because when I I look back and I think about the kids in that role, that row, um, with you know that was labeled as bad, we were all like the brown and black kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think that 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 experience played you know a significant role in like your desire to become politically active after you became an adult? Yes. Yes. Because there came a point where I reflected on a lot of the things that happened. Um, And and honestly, it came from me being a Chicano studies major Um, sitting in that class. I'm a very like analytical and deep thinker um, in just the way I think. And so I just started thinking back to a lot of the things that happened in that class in, in, in just in school in general. And while I recognize that a lot of those things made me um, very um, insecure about myself and made me doubt my abilities of even being smart or being yeah. able to be in school, I also realized that I wasn't the only one yeah. that felt that way. And I think it really dawned on me a couple years later when I also found out that one of my classmates from that class committed suicide. And I kept it, I kept in touch a lot with a lot of my friends that I had in 
middle or junior high because they were together in high school. And um, one of my classmates from that fifth grade class who actually was spanked in front of the whole class um, one time for being bad. He actually was he was white, but from a low income community. You know, he used to um, he had a lot of emotions. I remember he used to show his emotions as a kid, like cry and, you know, and people would tease him. And just like as I think about how all of our depression and, you know, um, different ways of thinking of ourselves are really rooted in our childhood experiences. Um, It just started really making sense to me. I think really clicking of like, I'm not the only one. And this is so unfair. It makes you angry. I think to that anger and why I really just wanted to get involved. And I, I, I constantly talked to, thought about my friend Jennifer who you know had just immigrated from El Salvador who I was trying to speak with in Spanish and be her friend and it, like I just I thought about her all the time like I wonder what happened to her and I wonder you know if she went to college and I you know and I constantly wondered about a lot of the kids that I went to school with and I just think like a lot of those experiences could really just keep someone pigeon held into something and to not really achieving their full potential and I don't I don't want that for my community. I want my community to see themselves as beautiful and amazing and smart and way smarter than I think, you know, we're led to believe and that really made me want to be involved in the Chicano movement, you know, my last year of high school, I saw a protest and it was a day without immigrants. And I remember telling my dad, you shouldn't go to work this day and I shouldn't go to school and they should see the world without us, you know? And, um, you know, my dad was like, you know, I agree. And, and he didn't know very, like very much about being active in the community or anything, but he agreed with that, you know? And I think it was a way that I talked to him about it. And that really like that last year of high school, it just made me really, think about it. And I'm like, when I go to college, like, obviously I went to Cal State Northridge where we have an amazing Chicano studies program and we had an amazing, amazing mecha. And my first day getting advisement in that Chicano studies department in the college of humanities, I remember I went to Chicano studies department and I said, I want to know who's in charge of mecha because I want to join on my very first day of school. Like I knew from being a high school, like that last year of high school, I didn't have those things offered to me. And I wanted to make a difference in that way because I was already, angry I was already I had been suspended for a few things um I know my my boyfriend at the time he had been um I had been told that he wasn't going to be allowed to go to prom with me because he looked like scum from the community, you know, just because of the way he dressed and you know he went to the local high school San Fernando High which is 95% Chicano you know um all of these flags were going off in my head and I'm like, yeah. something needs to happen. This isn't right. I'm being followed in stores. Like this isn't right. A lot of my family members were being incarcerated. Like, I'm like, this isn't right. Like, why isn't this, this right though? Like, you know, I just had to figure out why it wasn't right. Yeah. I, I can relate to that. I think it's shocking. I mean, it was for me anyways, to be, to be completely honest, when you realize that something is amiss, you know, because like when you're a kid growing up, you're just like, you don't really think about it. You know, things are the way that they are, but there comes a certain point in time, you know, in your life for some of us, not for everybody. Right. But for some of us where we look around and we're like, Oh, this is, uh, this is weird. Mm -hmm. Right. This Mm -hmm. is weird. It's, it's unbalanced. It's imbalanced. That's, that's quite a moment. It's, It's quite a moment. It was quite a moment for me too. And I think, you know, I've heard you, you know, talk about uh, Chicano studies a couple of times now and about Mecha. And you said that you went to Cal State Northridge, which Mm. is uh, quite famous for its uh, Chicano studies program. That's where uh, Rudy Cunha taught for for many years. Why did you decide to do Chicano studies going into uh, college and I mean, how how important was Mecha for you? I mean, for for me, Mecha was formative in yeah. my years at Michigan State. Turned me or or helped me to become uh, the person that I am today. I mean, there, there's no question about that, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about that. I think that um, Mecha is very important. Yeah. 
So honestly, I didn't see myself as a college student, to be very honest. Um, I actually was told by my high school counselor that I wasn't college material and that I wouldn't be able to get into a four year with my grades. And so I was you're going to sit down right now and like figure this out and make an application because you're going you're basically the last hope that we have for like a college graduate and you're going to go. My mom, I was like, well, we can't afford it. And she's like, we have credit cards, like, you know, and she's like, sit down and here's the card, put it in whatever it takes. And I remember it made me really sad too. And I think it it made me really um, reflect on how important this was for my family because my mom had said, like, if we have to sell the house and we have to figure something out, we're going to do that so you can go to college and so college was really important to them and um you know i'm a i wanted to give them everything that they wanted for everything they sacrificed for me and i was like all right but you know shatkin said that i'm not gonna be able to get in she goes oh you never mind you figure it out we figure it out She's like, and my mom had been working in financial aid at some colleges, um, mostly like a, like a lot of little like for profit ones. And then she had worked at Cal State Northridge, I think, for a while, too. So she was just like, we'll figure it out. Like, I, you know, I may not know everything, but, you know, I the thing I do know is that your local college, like they have to take a certain amount of people in the area. So she knew that. And CSUN is my local college. So honestly, I chose Chicano Studies because that was the only thing that interested me. Because of the fact I had been told to go back to Mexico so many times in high school, I knew there was something that said that, like, that this was my land, you know, and I just didn't know how to, like, formulate that. And so I really was just like, you know what? I think if I choose this major, I can win people in arguments because then I'll learn the real history. (laughs) That was honestly my my whole thought of going to be a Chicano studies major. And so I really just checked the box for Chicano studies. There was nothing else that I liked. I didn't like school. I didn't see myself as a smart kid. I had been told many times I wasn't a smart kid. So I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to go and I'm forced to go, I'm going to just go and learn this. And at least like, I'll like what I'm learning, I guess, you know? And so, yeah, so that's, that's really what led me to be there. I didn't know it was like a, you know, a staple, like, you know, program that people looked up to. I didn't know any of that. And so that's really why I chose Chicano studies. I just want it. It just stuck out to me. I looked at like the little like catalog thing about it. And I was like, oh, this sounds really interesting. I think I would like this, Um, you know, and then there was like I remember reading like a class description that talked about like social movements. And I'm like, yeah, if I'm going to do good at at, like college, it's probably just going to be this because I'm not smart. You know, at least I'll like learning this and I'll retain some of the information for the test because I was a really bad test taker. So that was just my thought. And being in Mecha, um, for me, it helped me keep my identity. Because like I said, I'm, I'm a really analytical thinker. I'm a really like deep thinker. And there was a point where I had to add another major because I was just cruising through my Chicano studies classes because CSUN, being that it has such a great program for Chicano studies, a lot of the GA requirements were folded in Chicano studies. So a lot of my classes started double counting. And within my second year, um, yo, and let me tell you, like, when high school say that you're not a smart kid, I was I pulled a 3.9 GPA my very first semester at CSUN. And I'm like, I have never seen a GPA like this. Like, I'm not stupid. I'm not like I'm not unable to learn. Like, you know, it's just and then there was a point I even thought I was like, maybe I was just bored in high school. Because I'm like, this is challenging me to think like like problem solve and think outside of the box. And I started seeing myself in a whole different way, you know, even in that first year at CSUN. And the only classes that were really holding me back were math and English because I was placed in um, remedial classes at the very bottom. So my first 
year actually I didn't really I was credit no credit so I didn't get college credits for English or math I was taking like you know backtracking basically and so you know um, for me I was like those were the only classes that stood in my way and so it just really gave me a new identity and then also um, being um, you know a Chicano studies major I really started learning and, and thinking deeply when I crossed into adding communications because it was in those classes that my 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 grades started dri- like dipping and I couldn't understand why. And I actually remember going to talk to this professor who I believe was originally from Texas. And he was just kind of like this country guy. And he had a lot of classes that he had a lot of tests that were scantrons. And I just I couldn't do these scantron tests like it, it just wasn't good for me. And. I got I remember he was like, you're pulling an overall C minus in this class. And I'm like, how I participate, I submit all the homework. I don't do very well on tests, but that was the only thing that was kind of bad. And he's just like, well, you're not very engaged. And I'm like, what? I participate every class because I know every class, you know, you get a syllabi that says you get participation points. And I'm like, I need all the points I can get if I'm doing bad on these tests. So I was very strategic in how I was even maneuvering the classes. And I'm like, I participate every class period. And I remember him saying, well, I just know that you're not very committed to being in college. Oh, And I couldn't understand that. Like, I just couldn't understand that. And I remember having a conversation with my Chicano Studies 100 professor who taught me about the educational pipeline, Dr. Elias Serna, who's still involved in the movimiento. And he he was like, nah, he's a racist motherfucker. Yeah. I remember him telling me that. And I was like, huh? no, that's not right. Like, I remember, like, I didn't want to attribute this, like, negative language to this professor, right? And he was, he, like, let me just have it like he just told me what it was and i was like you're right and he was was just he was trying to bench you yeah yeah yes yeah and i was just you know mind blown by that and and i remember and 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 dr said and i remember he was just like no you need to advocate for yourself you need to stand up and i i was timid and I, i believed what everybody told me about me you know up until that point and so, you know, I think Mecha really helped bring me out of my shell, like yell and shout and be OK with being loud and like making our voices heard and taking a stand. And, you know, that created, I think, that opening of like my throat chakra where I was yeah. able to use my voice to stand up and to call things out and to realize that, you know what? Our people are constantly told to sit idly and speak nice and and maneuver these settings in ways that are, you know, appropriate. And and you know what? It doesn't matter how much we do that. They're still not going to listen to us, you know. And so for me, it was like that, you know, Mecha being that driving force of me exercising my voice staying rooted in my identity and taking that continuous stand, not just for myself, but for our people, you know, and also making sure that I realized when the system of education itself was trying to change me. Yeah. And I think that is so important because I've seen so many Raza, so many brown people, especially, you know, being involved in so many different things that I was in. I was part of six different organizations on campus, one of which I was a founder of a sorority of a Latina based sorority, you know, nationally that was established on the East Coast during the height of the women's movement, right after, you know, all of the civil rights movement, the Chicano movement. Right. So my sorority was rooted in social justice and speaking up as well. But, you know, I did see how a lot of people that I met in that world as well, you know, have gone into these political political spheres and do not exercise their voice in that way because they're told that they cannot and they have to follow this, you know, rhythmic pattern that is okay in their jobs. And, you know, and um, homie, a shout out to the homie Fabian Pavon, who is um, a PhD candidate at um, 
UCSB right now for Chicano studies and a fellow organizer, but he taught me this word called careerist. And he, he was like, those people are careerist. And he is absolutely right because it's career over everything. And what does that career do right for those people? Is it funds them financially so that they can continue buying their Louis Vuittons and like all these expensive things instead of putting their money back into the communities that they came from, instead of teaching their communities how to navigate these things. It's about me. And it's about me being in the spotlight and that's what a careerist becomes right yeah. and a lot of our people a lot of the people that i even saw back then who were standing on the lines doing those budget cut protests with us in you know um in their organizations they were part of these things but as they went chasing you know because we all came you know from communities where our parents were struggling like they don't want that for themselves and they got so lost in the capitalism they got so lost in these white structures that they continue need to do that and you know what Mecha did for me and also I think organizations like El Partido Nacional de la Razonida and Chola Pinup did for me as I stayed in these grassroots organizing efforts through my time navigating not just my BA but my MA and my doctorate those organizations kept me grounded and kept me aware and kept me conscious in my identity and my people and that's what allowed me to never falter on them and my and my wanting to make things better for our communities you know and so I really have to attribute those spaces are so important and it hurts me so much that they've disappeared you know and and they're disappearing even more at higher rates I've seen after COVID you know especially a lot of these organizations don't exist on college campuses and a lot of them have allowed the educational system to infiltrate and to teach them that our identities are bad. And once one thing I've learned is once you, you lose your identity and you just go with the flow of what society is telling your, you your identity is, you lose yourself and you become part of that, you know, careerist I, identity. You become part of that social identity now where they're just streamlining you because you know calladitos mas bonitos you know and and now they've bought into that too yeah wow did you all hear it i heard it that's a strong <laughs> sister right there that's chicano <laughs> studies right that's me that's mecha that's yeah yeah, yeah. wow you know i just want to say real quick about the 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 word appropriate mm -hmm. I, i've always found that so fascinating that what people don't understand is that sometimes it is appropriate to tell someone you are a racist motherfucker. The yes. way that you are talking right now mm -hmm. is some bullshit, right? Yeah. Like, that's there are times. Yeah. Unfortunately, quite a few. Yeah. Where that is completely appropriate. It is appropriate to stand up and to tell someone you are wrong. Right. Yeah. Not only are you wrong, you're an asshole and you're wrong. Yeah. I mean, Yes, I think that that point is is important. It's important for our community. Well, they've sort of taken on this this idea that civility is the way to to get forward, mm -hmm. right? To be mm -hmm. light or to do this or. But I think it's important if somebody's being impolite to you, or they're being uh, harmful to you or to yeah. people in your community. It's completely appropriate to yeah. push back on that. And to yeah. and to call them out on to expose them for it and to and to work against that. So yeah, yeah, much and, respect and, on that, Vanessa. You know, thank you. You know, and the thing too about the term appropriate, like, oh, that's not the appropriate way to organize, or you know, um, that's too out there, and you shouldn't do that, right? When those people. I'm like, you need to recognize your privilege because you're not angry enough anymore. You're so far removed from the people and from their experiences that it doesn't aggravate you yeah. because you can sit nicely in your cushy $150,000 a year job yeah. with your family and everything's good for you. And so you stop caring about everybody else because you made it. It yeah. then became about you, you know? Yeah. And so I'm like, all those people that are like, oh, that's not appropriate. And, you know, oh, oh, those people... You know, they're trash from the hood because they still talk like that and this and that. And, you know, I even had people when I was doing my doctorate, 
and even a lot of my grad pictures that I took, you know, five years ago before a lot of people, you know, have really come out and started really embodying who they are and stuff like that. Right. Like I got a lot of flack for taking my graduation pictures, like with a shirt that said scholar on it that had like Chola highlighted and, you know, oh, why would you still want to identify like that? You know, once you've made it and I'm like, that's me and we made it. Yeah, I'm showing like this is who I am and I'm not changing. And and I remember like, you know, oh, well, you know, typically that's not what a doctor looks like. And I'm like, yeah, I'm breaking the mold. This is what a doctor looks like now. That's right. Like, you know what I'm saying? And it's like and it's everybody gets caught up in like emulating what it what it looks like or what it is and that's what really honestly hurts our community because then you have people that are in these positions that are using their rasa identities their you know like latinx identity to be like oh you know well i'm latinx and i would be the best person for this job so you know what they just click their diversity higher they just click that but you know what like they don't realize that they're also a token because they're just going with the flow they're not even pushing back Right. Or because they or know. even worse, they do realize they're a token. Yeah. And they don't yeah. care. And yeah. they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. So I, I definitely think like that's where that appropriate thing comes from. It's because people that are just so far removed now, like they're just like, well, you know, this is appropriate. And the, and they've just fallen into the structure. Uh yeah. they're, you know, now part of everyone else and they forgot, you know, their community and they're doing nothing to really help. So, I mean, one of the things that I've come to really admire about you over the last couple of years is is your commitment to like Chola culture, you know, like the work that you do around the um, the Chola conference and um, that whole like you can't spell scholar without Chola. Mm-hmm. I mean, I remember the first time that I saw that, I was like, oh, that's cool. Right. Yeah. It, it is. Right. And, it, and yeah. it really makes you it's disruptive. Right. In, yeah. in in the way that it makes you think about like what this means, you know, like what does it mean to 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 place that word within this other word to recognize that it's there, you know? Maybe you could talk a little bit about the the Chola conference and yeah. what it is that you guys are you all are trying to do with that. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, um I was doing my master's program in higher ed and there were no more opportunities for involvement, really. I couldn't really do Metra. Um, I went to my master's at Cal State Northridge as well. So I knew the Metra meetings and everything, but they were midday, you know, when I worked and I would go to school at night. So it was really hard to get involved. I got involved with an organization called Chola Pinup, and it was led um, by two sisters, um, Madeline Alviso Ramirez and Lala Alviso and uh, they were based out of Washington and they had chapters across the states and actually internationally. We had chapters in Guatemala, Mexico, Spain. And so I thought this was amazing. Like other mujeres that look like me, that talk like me, that had different variations of being cholas, right? And so it really expanded also my knowledge of like what who a chola is and, and what they do, right? Because I was just in LA culture, you know? Being part of this collective really uh, continued my organizing efforts um, and meeting, um, you know, Nena and uh, Nena is Madeline and um, all her sisters, you know, and finding out how she was had been documenting Chola culture for years. And she actually, um, you know, she needs to be cited somewhere, but she is actually the creator of You Can't Spell Scholar Without Chola. Mm. Um, and she created that shirt and while people, you know, have been using it, I think she doesn't get enough credit for it, which, you know, happens to our community very often. And someone popular comes along and more educated or, you know, has some titles behind their back and they start putting it into research and then they get credit for it. Right. So, you know, she actually coined that term, that whole phrase, that term capitalizing the chola in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I love that because I could not find others like myself in these environments, really. Um, and it was constantly the stigma of me still looking the way I did, wearing lip liner, you know, just presenting as myself. You know, one one day, like we just like we're all kind of nerdy cholas, you know, shout out to the homegirl Bashi who made that nerdy Chola shirt too, uh, the sweater. But 
we were all talking and a lot of us had, you know, navigated educational, you know, spaces. Some of them were also doing master's programs, doing teaching credentials after their BAs. So, you know, we were all navigating the spaces where we didn't fit and it's because we really stood out. Right. And so, you know, we had been talking like, oh, it would be cool to do like this type of conference and get all these like nerdy cholas together and find each other right like it was really about finding each other like creating community and so um you know we uh, the homegirls uh bashi and um nena they created what was um la bruja chola conference so it was more based on spiritual and healing um and they did that in like 2014 out of washington and i remember i went to i think the second or third one of that and it was really dope it was just at like someone's pad and like we just were all chilling like talking about spirituality and like really healing together and so you know things started evolving um things kind of transformed and changed over some time i was doing my doctorate i became um, um, the first one um, to receive the Excel scholarship through Chola Pinup. And so um, there were a lot of now people that were in education that were kind of like finding us and, you know, getting getting interested. And so right before the pandemic hit, I was like, you know what? We need to make this conference happen. And I'm like, I work at a community college. I know how to use the resources to create a free conference. Let me get in touch with some faculty and see if we can make this happen. And boom, I just started maneuvering the college. You know, one thing about me is that I'm street smart. So when I come into spaces, it doesn't matter what a space is. I'm going to figure out the free resources for my community. I'm going to figure things out to make take make a maneuver, right? So I was like, I, we can make this happen at my college, right? Little did I know I was going to get a lot of backlash from my identity and, um, you know, just kind of being really out there about who I am and trying to start this conference. I got, you know, apparently at a dean's meeting at my former college, you know, one of the deans had a question of like, do they really need to have that name for the conference? Do we really want all those type of people coming to this college? Right. And so it was very evident that it's still, you know, it's not appropriate, even for, you know, the Hispanics that work there in these Dean roles, they were, you know, yeah, they were not about it either. I even had a thing about, well, do you have a nonprofit status as an organization? And I was like, no, but can we open a foundation account here at the college and have the money funnel through the college? And he was like, yeah, you know, that would be best because, you know, people are going to wonder where the money's going and where, and I was like, all right, thank you, you know, Hispanic Dean for your support in that, like, you know, just calling that out you know like like a lot of people don't realize some things that that, that they say are just very <laughs> macro aggressive in a sense like especially yeah. for someone who understands right so that's really kind of a lot of the struggles honestly we face in bringing the chola conference um to a place i think especially where one of us worked um and i think more so as a staff member at a college campus where you're not allowed in a sense to be smart yeah. you know like there was comments there's been comments at my old college too by faculty that said oh I didn't realize staff also had doctorates you know and it's just coming from a place of where you know you are devalued in these systems you know they say students first and so it seems like they value you as students but once you become a staff member on their campus it's like you're there for work you know like yeah. you're no longer valued as a yeah. student um because you know everybody wants to follow the terminology right so um students first and we care about students but then they can mistreat those students when they become staff or faculty on the campus but you know it's just it was just a lot of uphill battle for that but really what it it really in a sense was it was really just a group of cholas trying to find the other cholas in the nation mm -hmm. that were like them that were facing the same things as they were that that did have this hunger for knowledge and learning and also putting in work for the community and so that's really how the conference started um it was like five of us who were original, you know, chola pinups, you know, originally um, coming together to finally see this come to fruition. Because I think over the last eight years of being involved in chola pinup and being homegirls and, you know, for some of us comadres, you know, um, be really allowing each other into each other's lives. 
it was finally the space that culminated all the things that we had talked about in our little circles and our sleepovers. And, you know, when we would go to car shows and stay in Vegas together or, you know, do things like that. It was like a culmination of all the things I think a lot of us dreamed about. Yeah. And, you know, um, luckily we're having our third annual upcoming um, this year in Yakima, Washington, which is so appropriate. You know, our founders of Chola Pinup, that's where they're from. They're from the Yakima Valley and they want to f- focus on the indigeneity of La Chola. So La Chola Shola, you know, um, and so really kind of honing in on that you know, inviting all the Cholas who have been, you know, and it's not just your research Cholas, right? So like we, we've gotten a lot of PhDs and met a lot of fellow Dr. Cholas, you know, but it's, it's not about that specifically for us. It's still about like the homegirls, you know, like it's still about um, creating um, that support and also bringing that to light and showing like your interpretation and your idea of what chola is um is being challenged because you've always been taught that we are criminals that we are no good that our attire makes us be a certain way um and you know here you are seeing cholas as you know trailblazing mothers and activists and um you know incorporating their identities and being chicanas and cholas and queer and bilingual and immigrant and indigenous and like all these different aspects of to who we are and bringing that to light and bringing it into spaces especially that have targeted us that have continued to say that we are not part of education that we are not part of these systems and we forced our way into that you know what i mean like the the issues that we faced even in trying to take it to miracosta college where i worked right and you know the pandemic hitting and us doing it virtually for the first year and then going to a school like uc boulder where our homegirl and fellow chola gabriela rios who's also a partido member as well from colorado you know bringing us in and, you know, creating that space for us and, you know, putting us at a predominantly white institution, you know, like where you're bringing in all these cholas, right? So like saying like, you know, we we do fit in these spaces and, and we are, we are coming in, you know, yeah. and while you haven't opened your doors to us, we are opening those doors for us and for each other and for our community. And this conference is free, like yeah. it should be, mm-hmm. you know, um, to create access for our community. Um, and so it's really about also being crafty trollas and figuring out how to get funding and figuring out all these things. Right. But when community comes together and we put, you know, our our minds together, we can make things happen. Yeah, I was uh, fortunate enough to be there for a part of it, you know, for the very yes. end. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a, a, a scheduling mistake <laughs> yeah i remember <laughs> but it was a happy one yeah, yeah. It, was, it was good to meet all of those people people that i had seen online for mm-hmm. years just to kind of see how things were going i'm really looking forward to um the one in yakima i want to take my daughter uh yes. leona and you know and go to this third one i think that it would be an incredible experience for her i, I'm, I don't have any doubt about that actually so i think yeah. it would be something that she would really really love and really benefit from. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think the work that you all are doing through the Chola conferences is, is important. I yeah. think it's very important. And I think time will, time will show, right. How important it really is. Yes. So, so we, we have about 10 minutes left. Yeah. And um, I was hoping that uh, we could talk a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing with uh, the Rasa Unida party. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, maybe you could just give us a little bit of background about how you got involved in that. Um, as I said at the beginning of the of the podcast, I mean, you're currently serving as the vice chair. Uh, yes. For those of you who are listening, I am serving as the, the secretary mm-hmm. uh, of the party. And so um, Dr. Bustamante and I have had a lot of opportunities over the last couple of years to mm-hmm. uh, work out some things and to think about the direction of the party and I have just always been so impressed with her clarity in terms of uh, vision and direction. And so, um, you know, Vanessa, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what's going on. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I actually got involved with the Partido um, 
as an undergrad, I actually met Ernesto Ayala and Genaro Ayala, Ernesto's dad, who um, Genaro had been serving as the chair for since the 70s, uh, you know, so um, and Ernesto being his son, uh, what had been involved with the partido and also I'm sure, you know, serving in all the, the positions on the central committee. And so I actually met them when I was a machista at Cal State Northridge because we did a lot of collaboration um, with La Razonida and so we had been in the same circles for a very long time. It was, again, through Chola Pinup and the organizing efforts. I believe it was a, it was a Chicano moratorium that Chola Pinup went out to and um, started talking to Ernesto and um, just getting more involved in efforts here in the San Fernando Valley. I'm originally from the San Fernando Valley. So, you know, um, I was like, yeah, well, I'm down the street from you. You know, it makes sense. Like, yeah, let's do the Cesar Chavez March and let's do these events. And so it was a, a collaboration between Chola Pinup and El Partido. I had been part of the study group, but I, I guess I was really confused about how you become a member. And I didn't know there was membership. I, it was just a study group and a, and a collaborative for me. Right. So organizing just kind of came out and and then there was a point right uh before I actually moved to San Diego uh where Ernesto was like hey I'm really serious about you know restarting everything the whole structure and I was like well I'm moving to San Diego and so that became difficult and um because of, uh, our study groups were in person as well so um actually the pandemic is what brought me full circle back to La Razonida. Um, I was contacted by Ernesto and he was like, hey, you've always been involved with us. You've been part of study group. Um, would you want to, you know, take on a position? We're going to start doing things remote and remotely. And I had told him I'm still in San Diego, you know, and he was like, we're going to do things remote. And I'm like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like if I can be involved, let me do it. You know, I always believed in La Razonida and the work. Um, that they really do for our community, you know, and I feel like that work has never wavered, you know, with the times and even with folks getting their education, I felt like it was still grounded, you know, and so I I loved El Partido and I was like, of course, you know, and so uh, I think we all just kind of came in helping, like we just were, we, none of us had positions, we just came in and we wanted to do this together and I know that's how we met yeah. you know and and I get really energized about anything having happening you know with our community and trying to uplift and trying to get the message out so um I think we just all started working and I think little by little a lot of my you know my vision in terms of being the only mujer on the central committee I think for me was a big responsibility um you know, being queer um, was also, you know, for me, a big responsibility in terms of even taking the step to run for the vice chair position at our Congreso two years ago. Um, you know, I wanted to provide representation, but not only that is like bring in more people that have, you know, intersectional identities to really inform the future directions of the party, yeah. you know, and, yeah. and I think that that's something I saw, you know, I know I have strengths in building bridges and creating community and relationship building. And so I felt that that's something I could bring to the table yeah. in my role as the vice chair. And so I will say I, I'm a lot of my ideas, they come through collaboration. And so hearing you talk about, you know, the Chicano plebiscite and, you know, just just being in these settings, right, where we just talk about things. Yeah. For me, that's how I get ideas and that's how I kind of kick into ideation mode. And so even being at the Congreso last year and seeing the forward direction of the Chicano plebiscite and how this is going to be a national, um, you know, plan and like really understanding where our community is and like, um having that understanding to bring us together in unity, to move us forward as a collective, to also uh, inform and advocate in a way that is inclusive and supportive of our entire Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx community, right? Yeah. is so important for me. And that's where I also, you know, at the Congreso um, is where I was able to also see, I think, a lot of, the, the the gap I think for mujeres and our queer and non and non binary folks and being at a table with you know four mujeres that were there in person, 
And I'm like, you know, having having these conversations about, you know, where they were at and just kind of how we felt. And I was like, all right, by the end of this meeting, we're going to call for a Chicana caucus. And, you know, and being and, and taking that initiative and standing up and being like, I, you know, I call to reignite the Chicana caucus and to really make some forward direction in terms of that. Right. And this is where I think like it, it's such a beautiful place to be within the partido because we all bring something unique and valuable to the table. Yeah. And I think sometimes what's hard is in our community, even, you know, for for a lot of the people in our community that have continuously been stigmatized, right? Like mujeres, our non-binary, our trans folks, right? Like they aren't yet seeing themselves as valuable, right? And I want to create that space where they do feel valued and they have a voice and they know that they're making a change in the forward directions of the partido is something that I really aspire to, you know, and seeing just our our collective right now as it is all the different pieces that we all bring into it is so beautiful i think in moving our community forward and so a big part of me is like everybody come in like you're all like have this and you know like you're all valuable and you all have this insight to change and transform the future directions of the partido and for us as a chicano community to come together right and so like that's really what I'm trying to bring um, and to, you know, uh, empower others, you know, to use their voices to bring as well. And we have some amazing people, you know, within the partido, our state representatives that are doing amazing work who are mujeres leading their state, you know, like that, all that like brings me great joy. And like, so for me, I just, I just right now, if we're in a process, you know, I think of still rebuilding and really creating those um, structures right where people can understand and like come together and like what I really want people to understand on the partido is because we are still in this building right that everything that our community brings is important yeah. and so this is a place where you will be listened to where you know you can bring those ideas that maybe have just been living within you you know that like we can help bring into the collective to make sure that the partido is inclusive for our people yeah. you know that the partido is that place that doesn't emulate other spaces right that is different and that difference is really us coming together you know so like I, I'm just really excited. I think of the forward directions. I, I do have plans to um, do um, a Chicana Liberation Conference, um, you know, bringing mujeres together, um, knowing that they have a space in the partido um, and really just kind of transforming that. You know, I think it's important to understand our historical foundations and to know that they were established in a time um, where our community members were being murdered for standing up. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, yes, foundations have not always been inclusive, but we have the opportunity to change that there and to transform that. That's and it right. doesn't mean changing our history. It means acknowledging our history and finding the gaps in that history to make it better moving forward and to recognize that we came from a time where people were being murdered and killed and shed blood for our liberation That's and right. for our forward progression. Yes. But we don't have to stay there, you know, and we can transform that. And that's what I'm committed to. Woo. That's what I'm committed to, too, sister. <laughs> also, T-O-O. -O. Yeah. I'm yes. committed to that T-O-O. -O. Yes. That's, yes. <laughs> that's a, well, when you get rocking, <laughs> it's hard to believe that you say you were a shy child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I had a language barrier. So everybody told me that my language was not right. And so I was really embarrassed to speak. All right, everybody. Thanks for, for tuning in. This has been a very pleasurable conversation with Dr. Vanessa Bustamante. Uh, Vanessa, thanks for uh, being a part of the reality dysfunction. I look forward to uh, working with you some more sister. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Mireles. I look forward to it too. We're going to change and transform for our Chicano, Chicana, Chicanx community. Yes. Word. All right. Till next time, y'all. Hey, homie. I'm getting tired of dudes just getting over on the raza. This is for the raza. raza, raza. This is the reality dysfunction.